Annette, of course, so was a charismatic woman, a tomboy of the greatest order, and super talented. However, she wasn't immune from scandals, and had one of the hottest scandals ever. How Annette Corso and Andy Griffiths caused the hottest scandals ever. Everyone loved the Andy Griffiths show. Well, not everyone. Phil Sunkel wasn't amused by some of the show's shenanigans. You should be familiar with the name Phil Sunkel. Let's jog that memory a bit. Remember the Andy Griffiths show episode, The Maybury Band? It's that one where the Maybury Band made a mess of Stars and Stripes forever. It was one of the show's many funny moments, and it led the fictional mayor of Maybury, Mayor Stoner, to declare the band as the worst in North Carolina. The mayor also proclaimed the band a disgrace to the town's name. So, there needed to be drastic changes and a new set of musicians to participate in the new and improved Maybury band. Sheriff Andy had a plan to fix this. Around this time, some rock and rollers were travelling through Maybury on tour, and he quickly drafted them into the band. One particular rock and roll band member appeared more on the screen than the others. This band member had a hipster look, sported a Van Dyke goatee, and boy, was he a delight any time he came on. In the episode, he blended with Don Knotts' Barney Fife with their complicated skin handshake. This band member played the trumpet, and it turned out that he didn't know how to read sheet music, saying that he would read lips to flow with the rest of the band. It was a delightful episode, and the Andy Griffiths show had a number of those kinds of episodes. The name of that band member was Phil Sunkel, and Annette Corso recommended it to Jim Fritzel to use. The name belonged to a real-life Phil Sunkel, who played trumpet, and Annette thought to honour him by using his name on the show, since they knew each other. The real Phil reached a certain peak in his jazz career as he got to play his trumpet alongside icons like Gil Evans and Stan Getz. The real Phil had a jazz band and recorded swing and cool jazz songs in the 50s. His band produced their long play, Every Morning I Listen To, in 1956 and worked with Jerry Mulligan and Bobby Brookmeyer on an album. The name of that collaborative album was Phil Sunkel's Jazz Concerto Grosso. Phil was surprised when he saw his name on the show, but he wasn't pleasantly surprised. He slammed a lawsuit on the Andy Griffiths show for $20,000, roughly around $180,000 today. Yeah, it was a lot of money. Phil accused the show of using his name without his permission. The show's producers preferred to settle out of court, and they paid Phil $5,000. Annetta felt pain from the experience, but it didn't get her kicked off the show. However, that wouldn't be the only parallel between the show and real life. Annetta herself shared some characteristics with her on-screen persona, Helen Crump. Yeah, Crump. The name isn't the sexy kind, and we'll tell you why the producers went with the name later on. You know what to do? Stick with us and you'll find out. When Helen was introduced on the show, she, like Annetta, was single and that wasn't the only thing they shared. Annetta shared her origins with her on-screen persona as both came from Kansas. Like Helen, Annetta cannot cook. The way Helen's inability to cook popped open in the show would forever be funny. So Barney Fife and his girlfriend, Thelma Lou, were sick of Andy's failure to find love and be with a woman so they wanted to matchmake him and Helen Crump. They devised an elaborate plan to arrange an intimate dinner party for Crump and Andy at Thelma's house. They just had one itsy problem. Crump dropped the bombshell that she didn't know how to cook. It was like Annetta was living her own real life. She never learned to cook when she was young. She preferred playing with the boys to hanging out with other women. Helen was a willful one and a tomboy at that. When girls her age played with a spatula, the actress played baseball with the boys. When she left her parents' house too, she didn't learn how to cook. There was no way she could have learned how, as in college, the dormitory cooks did the cooking, and from college she got chucked into Hollywood. She didn't get instant success, but when she struggled, she didn't have enough money to buy groceries or even cooking utensils. The sexy actress lived on a budget, a shoestring budget. When she made it as an actress, she had enough money not to need to learn how to cook. Corso believed that the saying that the way to a man's heart is his stomach is just propaganda to make women work for men, although she did say she would learn how to cook if she met a man who was best for her. 
did she meet that man? Well, we know she met a man, but was he the best man for her? We'll leave you to decide that. Annetta Louise Corso was born on November 3, 1933, in Hutchinson, Kansas, USA, to Jesse Harrison and Opal J. Corso. When she was young, she decided she wanted to become an actress and attended Northwestern University, where she studied drama as her major. One of her course mates was Lee Strasberg, one of the pioneers of method acting. The actress was eager to begin her career, and after her junior year, she believed she had gotten enough experience and quit college, although she returned to college to get a degree after she had gotten some success. The actress later took courses at the University of California, Los Angeles. Annetta's career wasn't off to a flying start, but she was ready to take on Hollywood. That's Hollywood for you. It chooses who it wants, and not those who choose it. Eventually, the delightful actress got to guest star appearance in a Robert Montgomery show, Robert Montgomery Presents, in 1955. Also, she appeared as a guest star in Producers Showcase, a live TV show. But where she truly shone was in The Blob, where she acted alongside her former sweetheart and fellow newbie, Steve McQueen. Annetta had more experience than Steve, as The Blob would be the first film he ever starred in, the two produced great chemistry in the film, and it was easy for them as they were former flames. The film opened up with the two kissing and pivoted from that early romance to become one of the best horror movies of its time. Sometimes we wonder if the film would have reached its fullest potential if the casting director had gone for another actor and actress. The film, which Irvin Yeaworth directed on a budget of $110,000, went on to earn $4 million at the box office. The actress moved on from that role and became a regular fixture in Mrs. G Goes to College or The Gertrude Berg Show, where she dazzled as the wife of a professor. She appeared alongside Marion Ross in the show. Like Annetta, Marion was also a regular fixture in the series, which was premised on a widow in her middle age going to college as a freshman. Marion Ross played Gertrude Berg's daughter. However, what truly made Annetta famous was entirely an accident. She got a part in the Andy Griffiths show as schoolteacher Helen Crump. The show's writers didn't intend for her to become a regular part of the show, so they gave her a name that signified the insignificance of her character. But the reverse happened. Helen had intense on-screen chemistry with Andy, and the producers decided to keep her. This came as a relief for Andy, who was a screenwriter for the show, and the other screenwriters. They had a terrible time writing for the female characters that were Andy's love interest in the show. We never knew how to write for women, Andy confessed. As a result of this limitation, Eleanor Donahue, the original love interest for Andy, left the show because the material they had for her was poor. Andy didn't blame Eleanor for quitting. He believed that the show failed the actress and not the other way around. In fact, when the actress wanted to leave as against her contract, Andy let her break the contract without any consequences. To Andy, his nature as someone who never understood women prevented him from writing well for them. He claimed he had a difficult time with women. It looked like this nature of his reared its head when Annetta joined the show. You see, at the centre of Griffith's inability to write for women, apart from his claim of failed romances with women, was his insistence that the show does not change from its core. He didn't want romance to be the major point of his show, so he preferred that the romance between him and Annetta in the series be slow. So, while Crump would be the woman that would teach Sheriff Andy how to love, they didn't have to rush the process. So, when there was a scene where Andy would act as if he wanted to kiss Crump and change his mind at the last minute, Griffith didn't appreciate this scene and wanted it cut out of the series. He complained to the director of the episode, Al Rafkin, that he and Helen trying to kiss was excessive, and he began to suggest that the romance should be in the air, without the two stars taking physical actions to actualise it immediately. So rather than the actor being the one to chicken out of the kiss and make the move, Griffith suggested that Barney Fife be the one to interrupt the moment. Griffith commented that Barney interfering would be so much better. The director agreed with him. Well, not that Al had much choice. Andy was the main character after all. Andy was relieved that all he had to do in the scene was just stare at Annetta. This was how the whole series went when it came to romance. 
Griffith kept it conservative, and even when the scene was right for some smooching between him and his on-screen lady love, Griffith tamed the situation by suggesting that they should kiss in private. However, the amount of touching in the series significantly improved. As Corso would later joke, Andy has no idea Helen has sex appeal, although she too admitted that she liked how he insisted that the romance go slow. Why wouldn't she like it? After all, it was the perfect cover for the greatest shenanigan that was happening off the screen. The cast and crew of the series loved to play pranks on each other. It wasn't only the series itself that was funny. The off-screen shenanigans were even funnier. One time the cast pranked Andy by stealing and hiding his shoes. The actor had to wear one of the props, the sheriff's boot, home. The prank was so funny that it was adapted into the show at different times. Andy got his laugh too. He would provoke Don not by calling him Jesse or Jess, his real name. Andy did it because Don didn't like his real name. But that was how the two rolled. They would have a lasting friendship and be there for each other in need. When Don was sick, Andy sat by his bed and encouraged him to breathe, and Andy felt his encouragement worked as Don did what Andy asked him to do. The greatest prank must be the one the cast and crew pulled on Andy and Annetta, so allegedly a young crew member dressed as a waiter and wanted to deliver food to Andy. He didn't go to Andy's room or anything, but chose to deliver his food to him at the special place Andy and Annetta shared. Some reports say he caught them in a position of physical expression. Griffith was allegedly furious. The secret was out. Andy was only conservative in public. In private, he was a bad boy. For all his conservative approach to on-screen romance and claims he couldn't write women well, the actor had no problem wooing Annetta. Actually, new revelations have said that Andy had no problem wooing anyone and was quite skilled at them. Most likely he didn't have great relationships with the women he starred with, and that was what affected his on-screen chemistry with them. There was one woman that he had a tense relationship with on set. Francis Bavier and Andy didn't like each other. The two saw things differently. While Andy wanted to joke and pull the occasional pranks, Francis was a bit stiffer and would prefer not to be the butt of anyone's joke or be part of the fun. But with Annetta, things were different. She lit a fire in him. The two had a full-blown not-so-secret affair, and you know the interesting part? Griffith was married at the time. His wife Barbara was at home while he messed around with another woman. According to author Daniel DeVise, Andy couldn't get enough of Annetta. He didn't just like her for the physical part of what they were doing. Allegedly, his end game was to marry Annetta. Despite being married, Andy allegedly proposed to Annetta more than once, but she shot him down each time he proposed. However, the two continued to star together in the Andy Griffith show and the spin-off, Maybury RFD, where she and Griffith were husband and wife. Annetta also took part in the TV movie Return to Maybury. The actress also starred in other projects after the Andy Griffith show and its spin-off, but none of them could have given her the same career satisfaction that the series gave her, but the actress wasn't out of work. Even as she was on the Andy Griffith show, she acted in some other projects. She was on A Rage to Live and Good Neighbour Sam, where she had an uncredited appearance. Annetta also acted in iconic films, even if we feel her best work remains with what she did with Andy. She was in The Toolbox Murders and Blazing Saddles. With her talent, it's not strange that she continued to get work. What is surprising is that she didn't reach greater heights, especially with her performance in The Blob. But hey, it's Hollywood. Talent isn't a guarantee of success. Some stars made a career off just being pretty so it's understandable if Annetta didn't reach the height she should have. The actress had other interests too. She co-wrote a mystery book with Muff Singer, who usually wrote children's books, and Robert Wagner. The actress lived a full life, but cancer cut it short on November 6, 1995, when she died of the disease after getting diagnosed with it. Just three days after her 62nd birthday, the sexy actress lost the battle in Studio City, California. Annetta was buried in Valhalla Memorial Park, North Hollywood. The charismatic actress didn't get married or have kids. While her relationship with Andy was said to have lasted for years, 
Maybe he wasn't the man that would make her take up cooking. In our next video, we delve into the captivating world of Elsa Martinelli, the mesmerising muse who fearlessly bared her soul and captivated hearts through iconic photo shoots that defined an era. Watch this video now!